This is muscle video number 17, and it should be the last video. It's muscle uh, tissue video number five. So within the tissue series, it's video number five. Uh, so let's wrap up the learning objectives from the previous video. Uh, we left off here describing tetany or tetanus, and we need to uh, finish up some ideas here and then go into the length tension relationship. So we talked about this already, where if you stimulate the muscle a single time, that there's an increase in tension, uh, that you know there's a latent period, period of contraction, and period of relaxation. We covered that in the last video. If you want to try to get towards sustained contraction, then you have to stimulate the muscle again, which leads to an increase in um, calcium ion concentration in the sarcoplasm. Again, the sarcoplasm is the cytoplasm of the skeletal muscle fiber. And we can continue to do that. And what you'll see here is that with each stimulus, I actually have an increase in tension over here until I repeatedly stimulate the muscle, in which point I get maximum tension. So uh, the next concept I want to look at is, is really related. If you look at this, I stimulate the muscle once, and uh, I, I start increasing the contraction and period of relaxation. I do it again. And what you'll notice here is that that second stimulus actually leads to a greater contraction, a greater amount of tension. The third stimulus leads to a greater amount of tension. The fourth one leads to an even more amount of tension. And then the fifth, sixth ones, they all actually have the same level of tension. So the question then is, why does this stimulate? And I have a stimulus. I have that red arrow coming over here. Why does this stimulus lead to this amount of tension? Whereas this stimulus leads to only this amount of tension. It just doesn't quite seem to make sense because if we're making the assumption that you know each stimulus releases um, an action potential that leads to the release of 100 calcium ions, for example, why is that the case? So the suspicion here, um, and at least the explanation, is that um, even though I come down here and I completely reduce tension, I have not completely... Uh, swallowed up or, or taken up all the calcium ions back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So at this point, when I've completely relaxed, now there's no more calcium bound to troponin, but some of those calciums are still making their way back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So if you look at that, what I'm saying is that there's no more calcium here, but some of them are still en route back to the sarcoplasmic reticulum when I stimulate you again. So when I stimulate you again, what that means then if I spill out another 100 calcium ions, if there were 10 that didn't make it back into the SR from the previous stimulus, now I've got 110 calciums here. And so the point being then that uh, that is why subsequent, uh, subsequent stimuli lead to actually greater tension within the same motor unit because even though the muscle is not contracting at that moment in time, some of that calcium is still available in the sarcoplasm, which is why when you stimulate it, there's even more uh, calcium present, which leads to greater tension. Okay, so now let's go on to the last concept here, which is the resting, uh, the length tension relationship. So what I want you to imagine here is a muscle sitting at what's commonly just called resting length. And what resting length means, it means somewhere along the, the, the midpoint of the sarcomere length. If we look at something like this, we see that there's my, my resting length of my sarcomere, right? There's my M line, there are my Z discs, there are my um, thin filaments, and the red, of course, is my thick filament. And what you'll see is that I can actually stretch out the muscle. If I stretch out the muscle, these Z discs go in um, opposite direction, right? That Z disc is moving this way, and then the other Z disc then is moving in the opposite direction, just like that. And so although it's not very dramatic here, this width from here to here is wider than this width here to here. So if you're just squinting at it, you may not quite see it, but if you took a ruler to it, you would actually be able to see that there's a difference. This is a, a lengthened sarcomere compared to this one. On the other hand, this is a shortened sarcomere. Now look what's happening. I've taken those Z-discs and I brought them in toward each other, so much so that this thin filament and this thin filament start to overlap. We didn't see that before here, did we? And we didn't see it here. But here, it's one of those things like if you've ever um, you know, stood on a city block and you go to cross the street and there's people on the other end of the city block crossing the street, and they're walking towards you and you're walking toward them and you end up not crashing into each other because invariably one or both of you will step to the side just before you crash into each other. And that's what we start to see here. As this thin filament approaches this thin filament, as the muscle is shortening, they're going to sidestep just a little bit. So the point being here that the sarcomere can exist in different uh, positions. This is your so-called resting length. This is a lengthened position and this is a shortened position. Now, obviously, there's shades of gray in between. We're just lengthening it. Length 
lengthening it as uh, as much as we can and shortening it as much as we can. So even though I'm only showing you three positions, there's various degrees of stretch and various degrees of shortening. So, so a muscle, again, coming back to this slide, can be at resting length, shorter than resting length, and longer than resting length. Well, if that's the case, how can you influence, how does this influence the amount of tension you generate? And all that is to say, look, if you take your biceps right now, wherever you're at, and you fully extend your elbow, your biceps now is in a maximally lengthened position. If you go and flex your elbow as much as you can, almost to the point where your palm is touching your acromion, then you're now in the shortest position you can possibly be in. If you kind of make a, a 90 degree angle between your forearm and your, your humerus, then this is a, a resting length, the middle length of the sarcomere, all right? So the question then becomes, in which of those positions are you strongest, so to speak, okay? Where can you generate the greatest amount of tension? And so if your biceps, so, I, so let's go ahead and relax. If you relax and, and, and someone were to passively move your hand up towards your acromion, okay? Not quite all the way, with just a little bit more room to go. Now, if you were to try to kind of hold your muscle there nice and strong, someone was going to try to pull your hand now away from your shoulder and you're going to resist them. Um, how much tension can you generate uh, versus if your muscle is in the mid length, how much tension can you generate or, or where are you strongest versus if your muscle is not quite fully extended, let's say your elbow is almost fully extended and there, how much tension can you generate? Well, most of you intuitively might say, well, when my muscle is at my mid length, that's what I feel the strongest. Um, and, and you'd be correct. That's where you generate the greatest amount of tension. So if you look here, this is the percent of resting sarcomere length. This is me at rest. My, this is your, your biceps with your elbow at 90 degrees, so to speak. This is your biceps com with the elbow completely extended. And this is your biceps with your hand almost touching your acromion. Okay? And so now what we're seeing is where do we generate the greatest amount of tension? It looks like you generate the greatest amount of tension when you are at or near resting length. When your muscle is long, you are weaker. When your muscle is shorter, you are also, similarly, you are weaker. Weaker. So how do we make that make sense? I mean, because that's what this length, the, the length of the sarcomere and the tension you're able to generate. How can we make this stuff make sense? Well, it's pretty simple, actually. So if we look at this, remember that the way that sarcomeres work is that the mice and heads need to reach up and bind to the actin filament, right? And that, that's what you need to be able to do. And now if you were to go here, let's see, let's do one, two, three. I'm counting the mice and heads here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Let, I don't know, let's say there's 11 of them there. And 11 of these mice and heads right over here have access to the actin filaments. Um, but if you look over here, then see these two myosin heads. There's a myosin head here, myosin head over here. Same thing on the opposite side. They actually no longer have access to the actin filament because you're in the lengthened position. And so, in some ways, it's kind of like saying, let's say you're you're rowing boats, and here you've got like you've got ten oars in the water, and you can generate a certain amount of speed. But here you've only got eight oars in the water, and you're not going to generate the same amount of speed if you've only got eight oars in the water, given the same weight, of course. So it makes sense then that the more myosins you can get binding onto actin, the more tension you're going to be able to generate. On the other hand, if you look here, it almost looks like, well, it almost looks like every single myosin head should have an opportunity to bind onto the actin filament. But actually, it doesn't really work out that way. And here's why. Remember how I said that these actin filaments, as they approach one another, they kind of, one of them has to step aside so they don't crash and then each of them start buckling. So this guy up at the top, he kind of slides above. And so when you look here, all these mice and heads that my cursor's going over right over now, uh, I, I'm sorry, sorry, let, let me be more clear. Uh, maybe I should use an arrow here because um, maybe that's a little bit clear. So see, see this mice and head over here and this mice and head and that mice and head and that one. None of these guys have access to this actin filament because it's just too far away. That actin filament took a step away and now the, none of those mice and heads that I just pointed to with the arrow can have access to that. So it's the same principle. You got fewer ores in the water. On this side, all you have are these mice and heads now where my arrow is pointing now, there, there. So look at the arrow, not at my cursor. So they're right over there, right over there. If you look at those mice and heads, those are the only ones, at least on this thick, this part of the thick filament, that can access actin. The ones up here cannot actually reach to actin, therefore they're not ores in the water again, and therefore they can't generate tension. So the length tension relationship simply tells us that our sarcomere is able to generate the greatest amount of tension when the muscle itself, or the sarcomere itself, is at resting length.
in a lengthened position, it is weaker. At a shorter position, it is weaker. I will not ask you, well, if it's at 170% versus 75% of resting length, I'm not going to ask you those questions. Uh, but I will simply ask you, where is the muscle going to be strongest in which position? Okay, so that should wrap up the last of our learning objectives, and that will do it for, for muscles.